Section 56 of Volume 1b of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1b section fifty six chapter twenty three part two these acts of violence exercised against all the nearest connections of the late king prognosticated the severest fate to his defenceless children and after the murder of hastings the protector no longer made a secret of his intention to usurp the crown the licentious life of edward who was not restrained in his pleasures either by honour or prudence afforded a pretense for declaring his marriage with the queen invalid and all his posterity illegitimate it was asserted that before espousing the lady elizabeth gray he had paid court to the lady eleanor talbot daughter of the earl of shrewsbury and being repulsed by the virtue of that lady he was obliged ere he could gratify his desires to consent to a private marriage without any witnesses by stillington bishop of bath who afterwards divulged the secret. It was also maintained that the act of attainder passed against the Duke of Clarence had virtually incapacitated his children from succeeding to the crown, and these two families being set aside, the protector remained the only true and legitimate heir of the House of York. But as it would be difficult, if not impossible, to prove the preceding marriage of the late king, and as the rule which excludes the heirs of an attainted blood from private successions was never extended to the crown, the protector resolved to make use of another plea, still more shameful and scandalous. His partisans were taught to maintain that both Edward the Fourth and the Duke of Clarence were illegitimate, that the Duchess of York had received different lovers into her bed, who were the father of these children, that their resemblance to those gallants was a sufficient proof of their spurious birth, and that the Duke of Gloucester alone, of all her sons, appeared by his features and countenance to be a true offspring of the Duke of York. Nothing can be imagined more imprudent than an assertion which threw so foul an imputation on his own mother, a princess of irreproachable virtue, and then alive, yet the place chosen for first promulgating it was the pulpit before a large congregation and in the protector's presence. Dr. Shaw was appointed to preach in St. Paul's, and having chosen this passage for his text, Bastard lips shall not thrive, he enlarged on all topics which could discredit the birth of Edward the Fourth, the Duke of Clarence, and of all their children. He then broke out in a panegyric on the Duke of Gloucester, and exclaimed behold this excellent prince the express image of his noble father the genuine descendant of the house of york bearing no less in virtues of his mind than in the features of his countenance the character of the gallant richard once your hero and favourite he alone is entitled to your allegiance he must deliver you from the dominion of all intruders he alone can restore the lost glory and honour of the nation it was previously concerted that as the doctor should pronounce these words the duke of gloucester should enter the church and it was expected that the audience would cry out god save king richard which would immediately have been laid hold of as a popular consent and interpreted to be the voice of the nation but by a ridiculous mistake worthy of the whole scene the duke did not appear till after his exclamation was already recited by the preacher the doctor was therefore obliged to repeat his rhetorical figure out of its proper place. The audience, less from the absurd conduct of the discourse than from their detestation of these proceedings, kept a profound silence, and the protector and his preacher were equally abashed at the ill success of their stratagem. But the duke was too far advanced to recede from his criminal and ambitious purpose a new expedient was tried to work on the people. The mayor, who was brother to Dr. Shaw and entirely in the protector's interest, called an assembly of the citizens where the Duke of Buckingham, 
who possessed some talents for eloquence, harangued them on the protector's title to the crown, and displayed those numerous virtues of which he pretended that prince was possessed. He next asked them whether they would have the duke for king, and then stopped, in expectation of hearing the cry, God save King Richard. He was surprised to observe them silent, and turning about to the mayor, asked him the reason. The mayor replied that perhaps they did not understand him. Buckingham then repeated his discourse with some variation, enforced the same topics, asked the same question, and was received with the same silence. I now see the cause, said the mayor. The citizens are not accustomed to being harangued by any but their recorder, and know not how to answer a person of your grace's quality. The recorder, Fitzwilliams, was then commanded to repeat the substance of the duke's speech, but the man, who was adverse to the office, took care throughout his whole discourse to have it understood that he spoke nothing of himself, and that he only conveyed to them the sense of the Duke of Buckingham. Still the audience kept a profound silence. "'This is a wonderful obstinacy,' cried the duke. "'Express your meaning, my friends, one way or the other.' When we apply to you on this occasion, it is merely from the regard which we bear you. The lords and commons have sufficient authority without your consent to appoint a king, but I require you here to declare in plain terms whether or not you will have the Duke of Gloucester for your sovereign. After these efforts, some of the meanest apprentices incited by the protector and Buckingham's servants raised a feeble cry. God save King Richard. The sentiments of the nation were now sufficiently declared. The voice of the people was the voice of God, and Buckingham, with the mayor, hastened to Barnard's castle, where the protector then resided, that they might make him a tender of the crown. When Richard was told that a great multitude was in the court, he refused to appear to them, and pretended to be apprehensive for his personal safety, a circumstance taken notice of by Buckingham, who observed to the citizens that the prince was ignorant of the whole design. At last he was persuaded to step forth, but he still kept at some distance, and he asked the meaning of their intrusion and importunity. Buckingham told him that the nation was resolved to have him for king. The protector declared his purpose of maintaining his loyalty to the present sovereign and exhorted them to adhere to the same resolution. He was told that the people had determined to have another prince, and if he rejected their unanimous voice, they must look out for one who would be more compliant. This argument was too powerful to be resisted, and he was prevailed on to accept of the crown and he thenceforth acted as legitimate and rightful sovereign. This ridiculous farce was soon after followed by a scene truly tragical, the murder of the two young princes. Richard gave orders to Sir Robert Brackenbury, constable of the tower, to put his nephews to death, but this gentleman, who had sentiments of honor, refused to have any hand in the infamous office. The tyrant then sent Sir James Tyrrell, who promised obedience, and he ordered Brackenbury to resign to this gentleman the keys and government of the tower for one night. Tyrrell, choosing three associates, Slater, Dighton, and Forrest, came in the night time to the door of the chamber where the princes were lodged, and sending in the assassins, he bade them execute their commission while he himself stayed without. They found the young princes in bed and fallen into a profound sleep. After suffocating them with the bolster and pillows, they showed their naked bodies to Tyrrell, who ordered them to be buried at the foot of the stairs, deep in the ground under a heap of stones. These circumstances were all confessed by the actors in the following reign, and they were never punished for the crime probably because Henry, whose maxims of government were extremely arbitrary, desired to establish it as a principle that the commands of the reigning sovereign ought to justify every enormity in those who paid obedience to them. But there is one circumstance not so easy to be accounted for. It is pretended that Richard, displeased with the indecent manner of burying his nephews, 
whom he had murdered, gave his chaplain orders to dig up their bodies and to inter them in consecrated ground, and as the man died soon after, the place of their burial remained unknown, and the bodies could never be found by any search which Henry could make for them. Yet in the reign of Charles the Second, when there was occasion to remove some stones and to dig in the very spot which was mentioned as the place of their first interment, the bones of two persons were found, which by their size exactly corresponded to the age of Edward and his brother. They were concluded with certainty to be the remains of those princes, and were interred under a marble monument by the orders of King Charles. Perhaps Richard's chaplain had died before he found an opportunity of executing his master's commands, and the bodies being supposed to be already removed, a diligent search was not made for them by Henry in the place where they had been buried. Richard III. The first acts of Richard's administration were to bestow rewards on those who had assisted him in usurping the crown, and to gain by favors those who, he thought, were best able to support his future government. Thomas Lord Howard was created Duke of Norfolk, Sir Thomas Howard, his son, Earl of Surrey, Lord Lovell, a Viscount by the same name. Even Lord Stanley was set at liberty and made steward of the household. This nobleman had become obnoxious by his first opposition to Richard's view, and also by his marrying the Countess Dowager of Richmond, heir of the Somerset family. But sensible of the necessity of submitting to the present government, he feigned such zeal for Richard's service that he was received into favor, and even found means to be entrusted with the most important commands by that politic and jealous tyrant. But the person who, both from the greatness of his service and the power and splendor of his family, was best entitled to favors under the new government was the Duke of Buckingham and Richard seemed determined to spare no pains or bounty in securing him to his interests. Buckingham was descended from a daughter of Thomas Woodstock, Duke of Gloucester, uncle to Richard the Second, and by this pedigree he not only was allied to the royal family, but had claims for dignities as well as estates of a very extensive nature. The Duke of Gloucester and Henry, Earl of Derby, afterwards Henry the Fourth had married the two daughters and co-heirs of Bohun, Earl of Hereford, one of the greatest of the ancient barons, whose immense property came thus to be divided into two shares. One was inherited by the family of Buckingham, the other was united to the crown by the house of Lancaster, and after the attainder of that royal line was seized as legally devolved to them by the sovereigns of the house of York. The Duke of Buckingham, laid hold of the present opportunity and claimed the restitution of that portion of the hereford estate which had escheated to the crown as well as the great office of constable which had long continued by inheritance in his ancestors of that family richard readily complied with these demands which were probably the price stipulated to buckingham for his assistance in promoting the usurpation that nobleman was invested with the office of constable he received a grant of the estate of Hereford. Many other dignities and honors were conferred upon him, and the king thought himself sure of preserving the fidelity of a man whose interests seemed so closely connected with those of the present government. But it was impossible that friendship could long remain inviolate between two men of such corrupt minds as Richard and the Duke of Buckingham. Historians ascribe their first rupture to the king's refusal of making restitution of the Hereford estate, but it is certain from records that he passed a grant for that purpose, and that the full demands of Buckingham were satisfied in this particular. Perhaps Richard was soon sensible of the danger which might ensue from conferring such an immense property on a man of so turbulent a disposition, and afterwards raised difficulties about the execution of his own grant, Perhaps he refused some other demands of Buckingham, who he found it impossible to gratify for his past services. Perhaps he resolved, according to the usual maxim of politicians, to seize the first opportunity of ruining this powerful subject, who had been the principal instrument of his own elevation, and the discovery of this intention begat the first discontent in the Duke of Buckingham. However this may be, it is certain that the Duke, soon after Richard's accession, 
began to form a conspiracy against the government and attempted to overthrow that usurpation which he himself had so zealously contributed to establish never was there in any country a usurpation more flagrant than that of richard or more repugnant to every principle of justice and public interest his claim was entirely founded on impudent allegations never attempted to be proved some of them incapable of proof and all of them implying scandalous reflections on his own family and on the persons with whom he was the most nearly connected his title was never acknowledged by any national assembly scarcely even by the lowest populace to whom he appealed and it had become prevalent merely for the want of some person of distinction who might stand forth against him and give a voice to those sentiments of general detestation which arose in every bosom were men disposed to pardon these violations of public right the sense of private and domestic duty which it is not to be effaced in the most barbarous times must have begotten an abhorrence against him and have represented the murder of the young and innocent princes his nephews with whose protection he had been entrusted in the most odious colours imaginable to endure such a bloody usurper seemed to draw disgrace upon the nation and to be attended with immediate danger to every individual who was distinguished by birth merit or services such was become the general voice of the people all parties were united in the same sentiments and the lancastrians so long oppressed and of late so much discredited felt their blasted hopes again revive and anxiously expected the consequences of these extraordinary events the duke of buckingham whose family had been devoted to that interest and who by his mother a daughter of edmund duke of somerset was allied to the house of lancaster was easily induced to espouse the cause of this party and to endeavour the restoring of it to its ancient superiority morton bishop of ely a zealous lancastrian whom the king had imprisoned and had afterwards committed to the custody of buckingham encouraged these sentiments and by his exhortations the duke cast his eyes towards the young earl of richmond as the only person who could free the nation from the tyranny of the present usurper henry earl of richmond was at this time detained in a kind of honourable custody by the duke of brittany and his descent which seems to give him some pretensions to the crown had been a great object of jealousy both in the late and in the present reign john the first duke of somerset who was grandson of john of gaunt by a spurious branch but legitimated by act of parliament had only one daughter margaret and his younger brother edmund had succeeded him in his titles and in a considerable part of his fortune margaret had espoused edmund earl of richmond half-brother of henry the sixth and son of a sir owen tudor and catherine of france relict of henry the fifth and she bore him only one son who received the name henry and who after his father's death inherited the honours and fortune of richmond his mother being a widow had espoused in second marriage sir henry stafford uncle to buckingham and after the death of that gentleman had married lord stanley but had no children by either of these husbands and her son henry was thus in the event of her death the sole heir of all of her fortunes but this was not the most considerable advantage which he had reason to expect from her secession he would represent the elder branch of the house of somerset he would inherit all the title of that family to the crown and though its claim while any legitimate branch subsisted of the house of lancaster had always been much disregarded the zeal of faction after the death of henry the sixth and the murder of prince edward immediately conferred a weight and consideration upon it edward the fourth finding that all the lancastrians had turned their attentions toward the young earl of richmond as the object of their hopes thought him also worthy of his attention and pursued him into his retreat in brittany whither his uncle the earl of pembroke had carried him after the battle of Tewkesbury, so fatal to his party he applied to francis the second duke of brittany who was his ally a weak but a good prince and urged him to deliver up this fugitive who might be the source of future disturbances in england 
but the duke was averse to so dishonourable a proposal would only consent that for the security of edward the young nobleman should be detained in custody and he received an annual pension from england for the safe keeping or the subsistence of his prisoner but towards the end of edward's reign when the kingdom was menaced with a war both from france and scotland the anxieties of the english court with regard to henry were much increased and edward made a new proposal to the duke which covered under the fairest appearances the most bloody and treacherous intentions he pretended that he was desirous of gaining his enemy and of uniting him to his own family by a marriage with his daughter elizabeth and he solicited to have him sent over to england in order to execute a scheme which would redound so much to his advantage these pretences seconded as is supposed by bribes to peter landis a corrupt minister by whom the duke was entirely governed gained credit with the court of brittany henry was delivered into the hands of the english agents he was ready to embark when a suspicion of edward's real design was suggested to the duke who recalled his orders and thus saved the unhappy youth from the imminent danger which hung over him end of section fifty six chapter twenty three part two recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington Section 57 of Volume 1b of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1b section fifty seven chapter twenty three part three these symptoms of continued jealousy in the reigning family of england both seemed to give some authority to henry's pretensions and made him the object of general favour and compassion on account of the dangers and persecutions to which he was exposed the universal detestation of richard's conduct turned still more the attention of the nation towards henry and as all the descendants of the house of york were either women or minors he seemed to be the only person from whom the nation could expect the expulsion of the odious and bloody tyrant but notwithstanding these circumstances which were so favourable to him buckingham and the bishop of ely well knew that there would be still many obstacles in his way to the throne and that though the nation had been much divided between henry the sixth and the duke of york while present possession and hereditary right stood in opposition to each other yet as soon as these titles were united in edward the fourth the bulk of the people had come over to the reigning family and the lancastrians had extremely decayed both in numbers and in authority it was therefore suggested by morton and readily assented to by the duke that the only means of overturning the present usurpation was to unite the opposite factions by contracting a marriage between the earl of richmond and the princess elizabeth eldest daughter of king edward and thereby blending together the opposite pretensions of their family which had so long been the source of public disorders and convulsions they were sensible that the people were extremely desirous of repose after so many bloody and destructive commotions that both yorkist and lancastrians who now lay equally under oppression would embrace this scheme with ardor and that the prospect of reconciling the two parties which was in itself so desirable an end would when added to the general hatred against the present government render their cause absolutely invincible in consequence of these views the prelate by means of reginald bray steward to the countess of richmond first opened the project of such a union to that lady and the plan appeared so advantageous for her son and at the same time so likely to succeed that it admitted not of the least hesitation dr lewis a welsh physician who had access to the queen dowager in her sanctuary carried the proposal to her and found that revenge for the murder of her brother and of her three sons apprehensions for her surviving family 
and indignation against her confinement easily overcame all her prejudices against the house of lancaster and procured her approbation of a marriage to which the age and birth as well as the present situation of the parties seemed so naturally to invite them she secretly borrowed a sum of money in the city sent it over to the earl of richmond required his oath to celebrate the marriage as soon as he should arrive in england advised him to levy as many foreign forces as possible and promised to join him on his first appearance with all the friends and partisans of her family the plan being thus laid upon the solid foundations of good sense and sound policy it was secretly communicated to the principal persons of both parties in all the counties of england and a wonderful alacrity appeared in every order of men to forward its success and completion but it was impossible that so extensive a conspiracy could be conducted in so secret a manner as entirely to escape the jealous and vigilant eyes of richard and he soon received intelligence that his enemies headed by the duke of buckingham were forming some design against his authority he immediately put himself in a posture of defence by levying troops in the north and he summoned the duke to appear at court in such terms as seemed to promise him a renewal of their former amity but that nobleman well acquainted with the barbarity and treachery of richard replied only by taking arms in wales and giving the signal to his accomplices for a general insurrection in all parts of england but at that very time there happened to fall such heavy rains so incessant and continued as exceeded any known in the memory of man and the severn with the other rivers in that neighbourhood swelled to a height which rendered them impassable and prevented buckingham from marching into the heart of england to join his associates the welshmen partly moved by superstition at this extraordinary event partly distressed by famine in their camp fell off from him and buckingham finding himself deserted by his followers put on a disguise and took shelter in the house of bannister an old servant of his family but being detected in his retreat he was brought to the king at salisbury and was instantly executed according to the summary method practised in that age the other conspirators who took arms in four different places at exeter at salisbury at newbury and at maidstone hearing of the duke of buckingham's misfortunes despaired of success and immediately dispersed themselves the marquis of dorset and the bishop of ely made their escape beyond sea many others were equally fortunate several fell into richard's hands of whom he made some examples his executions seem not to have been remarkably severe though we are told of one gentleman william collingborn who suffered under color of this rebellion but in reality for a distich of quibbling verses which he had composed against richard and his ministers the earl of richmond in concert with his friends had set sail from st malo's carrying on board a body of five thousand men levied in foreign parts but his fleet being at first driven back by a storm he appeared not on the coast of england till after the dispersion of all his friends and he found himself obliged to return to the court of Brittany. the king everywhere triumphant and fortified by this unsuccessful attempt to dethrone him ventured at last to summon a parliament a measure which his crimes and flagrant usurpation had induced him hitherto to decline though it was natural that the parliament in a contest of national parties should always adhere to the victor he seems to have apprehended lest his title founded on no principle and supported by no party might be rejected by that assembly but his enemies being now at his feet the parliament had no choice left but to recognize his authority and acknowledge his right to the crown his only son edward then a youth of twelve years of age was created prince of wales the duties of tonnage and poundage were granted to the king for life and richard in order to reconcile the nation to his government passed some popular laws particularly one alluding to the names of ratcliffe and catsby and to richard's arms which were a bore against the late practice of extorting money on pretence of benevolence
all the other measures of the king tended to the same object. Sensible that only circumstances which could give him security was to gain the confidence of the Yorkists, he paid court to the queen dowager with such art and address, made such earnest protestations of his sincere good will and friendship, that this princess, tired of confinement and despairing of any success from her former projects, ventured to leave her sanctuary and to put herself and her daughters into the hands of the tyrant. But he soon carried further his views for the establishment of his throne. He had married Anne, the second daughter of the Earl of Warwick, and widow of Edward, Prince of Wales, whom Richard himself had murdered. But this princess having borne him but one son, who died about this time, he considered her as an invincible obstacle to the settlement of his fortune, and he was believed to have carried her off by poison, a crime for which the public could not be supposed to have any solid proof, but which the usual tenor of his conduct made it reasonable to suspect. He now thought it in his power to remove the chief perils which threatened his government. The Earl of Richmond, he knew, could never be formidable, but from his projected marriage with Princess Elizabeth, the true heir of the crown, and he therefore intended, by means of a papal dispensation, to espouse himself this princess, and thus to unite in his own family their contending titles. The Queen Dowager, eager to recover her lost authority, either scrupled this alliance, which was very unusual in England, and was regarded as incestuous, nor felt any horror at marrying her daughter to the murderer of her three sons and of her brother. She even joined so far their interests with those of the usurper, that she wrote to all her partisans, and among the rest to her son, the Marquis of Dorset, desiring them to withdraw from the Earl of Richmond, an injury which the earl could never afterwards forgive. The court of Rome was applied to for a dispensation. Richard thought that he could easily defend himself during the interval till it arrived, and he had afterwards the agreeable prospect of a full and secure settlement. He flattered himself that the English nation, seeing all danger removed from a disputed succession, would then acquiesce under the dominion of a prince who was of mature years of great abilities, and of a genius qualified for government, and that they would forgive him all the crimes which he had committed in paving his way to the throne. But the crimes of Richard were so horrid and so shocking to humanity, that the natural sentiments of men, without any political or public views, were sufficient to render his government unstable, and every person of probity and honor was earnest to prevent the scepter from being any longer polluted by that bloody and faithless hand which held it. All the exiles flocked to the Earl of Richmond in Brittany, and exhorted him to hasten his attempt for a new invasion, and to prevent the marriage of the Princess Elizabeth, which must prove fatal to all his hopes. The Earl, sensible to the urgent necessity but dreading the treachery of Peter Landis, who had entered into a negotiation with Richard for betraying him, was obliged to attend only to his present safety, and he made his escape to the court of France. The ministers of Charles the Eighth, who had now succeeded to the throne after the death of his father Louis, gave him countenance and protection, and being desirous of raising disturbance to Richard, they secretly encouraged the earl in the levies which he made for the support of his enterprise upon England. The Earl of Oxford, whom Richard's suspicions had thrown into confinement, having made his escape, here joined Henry, and inflamed his ardor for the attempt by a favorable account which he brought of the dispositions of the English nation and their universal hatred of Richard's crimes and usurpation. The Earl of Richmond set sail from Harfleur in Normandy, with a small army of about two thousand men, and after a navigation of six days he arrived at Milford Haven in Wales, where he landed without opposition. He directed his course to that part of the kingdom, in hopes that the Welsh, who regarded him as their countrymen, and who had been already prepossessed in favor of his cause by means of the Duke of Buckingham, would join his standard and enable him to make head against the established government. Richard, who knew not in what quarter he might expect the invader, 
had taken post at Nottingham, in the centre of the kingdom, and having given commissions to different persons in several counties whom he empowered to oppose his enemy, he proposed in person to fly on the first alarm to the place exposed to danger. Sir Rice Up Thomas and Sir Walter Herbert were entrusted with his authority in Wales, but the former immediately deserted to Henry, the second made but feeble opposition to him, and the earl, advancing toward Shrewsbury, received every day some reinforcement from his partisans. Sir Gilbert Talbot joined him with all the vassals and retainers of the family of Shrewsbury. Sir Thomas Boucher and Sir Walter Hungerford brought their friends to share his fortunes, and the appearance of men of distinction in his camp made already his cause wear a favorable aspect. But the danger to which Richard was chiefly exposed proceeded not so much from the zeal of his open enemies as from the infidelity of his pretended friends. Scarce any nobleman of distinction was sincerely attached to his cause except the Duke of Norfolk, and all those who feigned the most loyalty were only watching for an opportunity to betray and desert him. But the persons of whom he entertained the greatest suspicion were Lord Stanley and his brother Sir William, whose connections with the family of Richmond, notwithstanding their professions of attachment to his person, were never entirely forgotten or overlooked by him. When he empowered Lord Stanley to levy forces, he still retained his eldest son, Lord Strange, as a pledge for his fidelity, and that nobleman was, on this account, obliged to employ great caution and reserve in his proceedings. He raised a powerful body of his friends and retainers in Cheshire and Lancashire, but without openly declaring himself, and though Henry had received secret assurances of his friendly intentions, the armies on both sides knew not what to infer from this equivocal behavior. The two rivals at last approached each other at Bosworth, near Leicester. Henry at the head of six thousand men, Richard with an army of above double the number, and a decisive action was every hour expected between them. Stanley, who commanded above seven thousand men, took care to post himself at Atherstone, not far from the hostile camps, and he made such a disposition as enabled him on occasion to join either party. Richard had too much sagacity not to discover his intentions from these movements, but he kept the secret from his own men for fear of discouraging them. He took not immediate revenge on Stanley's son, as some of his courtiers advised him, because he hoped that so valuable a pledge would induce the father to prolong still further his ambiguous conduct, and he hastened to decide by arms the quarrel with his competitor, being certain that a victory over the Earl of Richmond would enable him to take simple revenge on all his enemies, open and concealed. The van of Richmond's army, consisting of archers, was commanded by the Earl of Oxford. Sir Gilbert Talbot led the right wing, Sir John Savage the left, the earl himself, accompanied by his uncle the Earl of Pembroke, placed himself in the main body. Richard also took post in his main body, and entrusted the command of his van to the Duke of Norfolk. As his wings were never engaged, we have not learned the names of the several commanders. Soon after the battle began, Lord Stanley, whose conduct in this whole affair discovers great precaution and abilities, appeared in the field and declared for the Earl of Richmond. This measure, which was unexpected to the men, though not to their leaders, had a proportional effect on both armies. It inspired unusual courage into Henry's soldiers. It threw Richard's into dismay and confusion. The intrepid tyrant, sensible of his desperate situation, cast his eye around the field, and descrying his rival at no great distance, he drove against him with fury, in hopes that either Henry's death or his own would decide the victory between them. He killed with his own hands Sir William Brandon, standard bearer to the Earl. He dismounted Sir John Cheney. He was now within reach of Richmond himself, who declined not the combat, when Sir William Stanley, breaking in with his troops, surrounded Richard, who, fighting bravely to the last moment, was overwhelmed by numbers and perished by a fate too mild and honorable for his multiplied and detestable enormities. His men everywhere sought for safety by flight. <laughs>
there fell in this battle about four thousand of the vanquished and among these the duke of norfolk lord ferris of chartley sir richard ratcliffe sir robert piercy and sir robert brackenbury the loss was inconsiderable on the side of the victors sir william catsby a great instrument of richard crimes was taken and soon after beheaded with some others at leicester the body of richard was found in the field covered with dead enemies and all besmeared with blood it was thrown carelessly across a horse was carried to leicester amidst the shouts of the insulting spectators and was interred in the greyfriars church of that place the historians who favor richard for even this tyrant has met with partisans among the later writers maintain that he was well qualified for government had he legally obtained it that he committed no crimes but such as were necessary to procure him possession of the crown but this is a poor apology when it is confessed that he was ready to commit the most horrid crimes which appeared necessary for that purpose and it is certain that all his courage and capacity qualities in which he really seems not to have been deficient would never have made compensation to the people for the danger of the precedent and for the contagious example of vice and murder exalted upon the throne this prince was of small stature humpbacked and had a harsh disagreeable countenance so that his body was in every particular no less deformed than his mind thus we have pursued the history of england through a series of many barbarous ages till we have at last reached the dawn of civility and science and have the prospect both of greater certainty in our historical narrations and of being able to present to the reader a spectacle more worthy of his attention the want of certainty however and of circumstances is not unlike to be complained of throughout every period of this long narration this island possesses many ancient historians of good credit as well as many historical monuments and it is rare that the annals of so uncultivated a people as were the english as well as other european nations after the decline of roman learning have been transmitted to posterity so complete and with so little mixture of falsehood and of fable this advantage we owe entirely to the clergy of the church of rome who founding their authority on their superior knowledge preserved the precious literature of antiquity from a total extinction and under shelter of their numerous privileges and immunities acquired a security by means of the superstition which they would in vain have claimed from the justice and humanity of those turbulent and licentious ages end of section fifty seven chapter twenty three part three recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington section fifty eight of volume one b of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by richard carpenter history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume Volume One B, Section Fifty Eight, Chapter Twenty Three, Part Four. Nor is the spectacle altogether unentertaining and uninstructive, which the history of those times presents to us. The view of human manners, in all their variety of appearances, is both profitable and agreeable. And if the aspect in some periods seem horrid and deformed, we may thence learn to cherish with greater anxiety that science and civility which has so close a connection with virtue and humanity and which as it is a sovereign antidote against superstition is also the most effectual remedy against vice and disorders of every kind the rise progress perfection and decline of art and science are curious objects of contemplation and intimately connected with a narration of civil transactions the events of no particular period can be fully accounted for but by considering the degrees of advancement which men have reached in those particulars those who cast their eye 
on the general revolutions of society, we will find that, as almost all improvements of the human mind had reached nearly to their state of perfection about the age of Augustus, there was a sensible decline from that point or period, and men, thenceforth, relapsed gradually into ignorance and barbarism. The unlimited extent of the Roman Empire, and the consequent despotism of its monarchs, extinguished all emulation, debased the generous spirits of men, and depressed that noble flame by which all the refined arts must be cherished and enlivened. The military government, which soon succeeded, rendered even the lives and properties of men insecure and precarious, and proved destructive to those vulgar and more necessary arts of agriculture, manufactures, and commerce, and, in the end, to the military art and genius itself, by which alone the immense fabric of the empire could be supported. The eruption of the barbarous nations, which soon followed, overwhelmed all human knowledge, which was already far in its decline, and men sunk every age deeper into ignorance, stupidity, and superstition, till the light of ancient science and history had very nearly suffered a total extinction in all the European nations. But there is a point of depression, as well as of exaltation, from which human affairs naturally return in a contrary direction, and beyond which they seldom pass either in their advancement or decline. The period in which the people of Christendom were the lowest sunk in ignorance, and consequently in disorders of every kind, may justly be fixed at the eleventh century, about the age of William the Conqueror, and from that era the sun of science, beginning to reascend, threw out many gleams of light, which preceded the full morning when letters were revived in the fifteenth century. The Danes and other northern people, who had so long infested all the coasts, and even the island parts of Europe, by their depredations, having now learned the art of tillage and agriculture, found a certain subsistence at home, and were no longer tempted to desert their industry in order to seek a precarious livelihood by rapine and by plunder of their neighbors. The feudal governments also among the more southern nations were reduced to a kind of system, and though that strange species of civil polity was ill-fitted to ensure either liberty or tranquillity, it was preferable to the universal license and disorder which had everywhere preceded it. But perhaps there was no event which tended further to the improvement of the age than one which has not been much remarked, the accidental finding of a copy of Justinian's Pandex about the year 1130 in the town of Amalfi in Italy. The ecclesiastics who had leisure and some inclination to study immediately adopted with zeal this excellent system of jurisprudence and spread the knowledge of it throughout every part of Europe. Besides the intrinsic merit of the performance, it was recommended to them by its original connection with the imperial city of Rome, which, being the seat of their religion, seemed to acquire a new luster and authority by the diffusion of its laws over the western world. In less than ten years after the discovery of the Pandex, Vicarius, under the protection of Theobald, Archbishop of Canterbury, read public lectures of civil law in the University of Oxford, and the clergy everywhere, by their example as well as by exhortation, were the means of diffusing the highest esteem for this new science. That order of men, having large possessions to defend, was in a manner necessitated to turn their studies towards law, and their properties being often endangered by the violence of princes and barons, it became their interest to enforce the observance of general and equitable rules from which alone they could receive protection. As they possessed all the knowledge of the age and were alone acquainted with the habits of thinking, the practice as well as science of the law fell mostly into their hands, and though the close connection which, without any necessity, they formed between the canon and civil law, beget a jealousy in the laity of England, and prevented the Roman jurisprudence from becoming the municipal law of the country, as was the case in many states of Europe, a great part of it secretly transferred into the practice of courts of justice, 
and the imitation of their neighbors made the English gradually endeavor to raise their own law from its original state of rudeness and imperfection. It is easy to see what advantages Europe must have reaped by its inheriting at once from the ancients so complete an art, which was also so necessary for giving security to all other arts, and which, by refining and still more by bestowing solidity on the judgment, served as a model to further improvements. The sensible utility of the Roman law, both to public and private interest, recommended the study of it at a time when the more exalted and speculative sciences carried no charms with them, and thus the last branch of ancient literature, which remained uncorrupted, was happily the first transmitted to the modern world. For it is remarkable that in the decline of Roman learning, when the philosophers were universally infected with superstition and sophistry, and the poets and historians with barbarism, the lawyers, who in other countries are seldom models of science or politeness, were yet able, by the constant study and close imitation of their predecessors, to maintain the same good sense in their decisions and reasoning, and the same purity in their language and expression. What bestowed an additional merit on the civil law was the extreme imperfection of that jurisprudence which preceded it among all the European nations, especially among the Saxons or ancient English. The absurdities which prevailed at the time in the administration of justice may be conceived from the authentic monuments which remain of the ancient Saxon laws, where a pecuniary commutation was received for every crime, where stated prices were fixed for men's lives and members, where private revenges were authorized for all injuries, where the use of the ordeal, corsnet, and afterwards the duel, were received methods of proof, and where the judges were rustic freeholders, assembled of a sudden, and deciding a cause from one debate or altercation of the parties. Such a state of society was very little advanced beyond the rude state of nature. Violence universally prevailed, instead of general and equitable maxims, the pretended liberty of the times was only an incapacity of submitting to government, and men not protected by law in their lives and properties sought shelter by their personal servitude and attachments under some powerful chieftain or by voluntary combinations. The gradual progress of improvement raised the Europeans somewhat above this uncultivated state, and affairs in this island particularly took early a turn which was more favorable to justice and to liberty. Civil employments and occupations soon became honorable among the English. The situation of that people rendered not the perpetual attention to wars so necessary as among their neighbors, and all regard was not confined to the military profession. The gentry and even the nobility began to deem an acquaintance with the law a necessary part of education. They were less diverted than afterwards from the study of this kind by other sciences. In the age of Henry the Sixth, as we are told by Fortescue, there were in the inns of courts about two thousand students, most of them men of honorable birth, who gave application to this branch of civil knowledge, a circumstance which proves that a considerable progress was already made in the science of government, and which prognosticated a still greater. One chief advantage which resulted from the introduction and progress of the arts was the introduction and progress of freedom, and this consequence affected men both in their personal and civil capacities. If we consider the ancient state of Europe, we shall find that the far greater part of the society were everywhere bereaved of their personal liberty and lived entirely at the will of their masters. Every one that was not noble was a slave. The peasants were sold along with the land. The few inhabitants of the cities were not in a better condition. Even the gentry themselves were subject to a long train of subordination under the greater barons, or chief vassals of the crown, who, though seemingly placed in a high state of splendor, yet having but a slender protection from law, were exposed to every tempest of the state, and, by the precarious condition in which they lived, paid dearly for the power of oppressing and tyrannizing over their inferiors. The first incident which broke 
in upon this violent system of government was the practice begun in italy and imitated in france of erecting communities and corporations endowed with privileges and a separate municipal government which gave them protection against the tyranny of the barons and which the prince himself deemed it prudent to respect the relaxation of the feudal tenures and an execution somewhat stricter of the public law bestowed an independence on vassals which was unknown to their forefathers and even the peasants themselves though later than other orders of the state made their escape from those bonds of villainage or slavery in which they had formerly been retained it may appear strange that the progress of the arts which seems among the greeks and romans to have daily increased the number of slaves should in later times have proved so general a source of liberty but this difference in the events proceeded from a great difference in the circumstances which attended those institutions the ancient barons obliged to maintain themselves continually in a military posture and little emulous of elegance or splendor employed not their villains as domestic servants much less as manufacturers but composed their retinue of freemen whose military spirit rendered the chief formidable to his neighbors and who were ready to attend him in every warlike enterprise the villains were entirely occupied in the cultivation of their master's land and paid their rents either in corn and cattle and other produce of the farm or in servile offices which they performed about the baron's family and upon the farms which he retained in his own possession in proportion as agriculture improved and money increased it was found that these services though extremely burdensome to the villain were of little advantage to the master and that the produce of a large estate could be much more conveniently disposed of by the peasants themselves who raised it than by the landlord or his bailiff who were formerly accustomed to receive it a commutation was therefore made of rents for services and of money rents for those in kind as men in a subsequent age discovered that farms were better cultivated where the farmer enjoyed a security in his possession the practice of granting leases to the peasant began to prevail which entirely broke the bonds of servitude already much relaxed from the former practices after this manner villainage went gradually into disuse throughout the more civilized parts of europe the interest of the master as well as that of the slave concurred in this alteration the latest laws which we find in england for enforcing or regulating this species of servitude were enacted in the reign of henry the seventh and though the ancient statutes on this subject remain still unrepealed by parliament it appears that before the end of elizabeth the distinction of villian and freeman was totally though insensibly abolished and that no person remained in the state to whom the former laws could be applied thus personal freedom became almost general in europe an advantage which paved the way for the increase of political or civil liberty and which even where it was not attended with this salutary effect served to give members of the community some of the most considerable advantages of it the constitution of the english government ever since the invasion of this island by the saxons may boast of this preeminence that in no age the will of the monarch was ever entirely absolute and uncontrolled but in other respects the balance of power has extremely shifted among the several orders of the state and this fabric has experienced the same mutability that has attended all human institutions the ancient saxons like the other german nation where each individual was inured to arms and where the independence of men was secured by a great equality of possessions seem to have admitted a considerable mixture of democracy into their form of government and to have been one of the freest nations of which there remains any account in the records of history after this tribe was settled in england especially after the dissolution of the heptarchy the great extent of the kingdom produced a great inequality in property and the balance seems to have inclined to the side of aristocracy 
the Norman conquest threw more authority into the hands of the sovereign, which, however, admitted of great control, though derived less from the general forms of the constitution, which were inaccurate and irregular, than from the independent power enjoyed by each baron in his particular district or province. The establishment of the great charter exalted still higher the aristocracy, imposed regular limits on royal power, and gradually introduced some mixture of democracy into the constitution. But even during this period, from the accession of Edward I to the death of Richard III, the condition of the commons was nowise eligible, a kind of Polish aristocracy prevailed, and though the kings were limited, the people were as yet far from being free. It required the authority, almost absolute, of the sovereigns, which took place in the subsequent period to pull down those disorderly and licentious tyrants who were equally averse from peace and from freedom, and to establish that regular execution of the laws which, in the following age, enabled the people to erect a regular and equitable plan of liberty. In each of these successive alterations, the only rule of government which is intelligible, or carries any authority with it, is the established practice of the age, and the maxims of administration which are at that time prevalent and universally assented to. Those who, from a pretended respect of antiquity, appeal at every turn to an original plan of the Constitution, only cover their turbulent spirit and their private ambition under the appearance of venerable forms, and whatever period they pitch on for their model, they may still be carried back to a more ancient period, where they will find the measures of power entirely different, and where every circumstance, by reason of the greater barbarity of the times, will appear still less worthy of imitation. Above all, a civilized nation like the English, who have happily established the most perfect and most accurate system of liberty that was ever found compatible with government, ought to be cautious in appealing to the practice of their ancestors or regarding the maxims of uncultivated ages as certain rules for their present conduct. An acquaintance with the ancient periods of their government is chiefly useful by instructing them to cherish their present constitution from a comparison or contrast with the condition of those distant times. And it is also curious by showing them the remote and commonly faint and disfigured originals of the most finished and most noble institutions, and by instructing them in the great mixture of accident which commonly occurs with a small ingredient of wisdom and foresight in erecting the complicated fabric of the most perfect government. End of section 58, chapter 23, part 4. End of volume 1b, recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington.